Hello and welcome to Crash Course. Today we're going to be looking at the gastrointestinal system. So this could be really good for first years as revision for exams, but also for second and third years to look back at the basic anatomy and physiology, the foundation blocks to the GI system. So in this video we're going to be looking at an introduction and the basic principles of the GI system. We're also going to take a look at the anatomy and physiology and also at the embryology. In part two, we'll then go on to look at the innovation and vasculature of the GI system. And then in part three, we'll take a look at the pathway of the GI system from mouth to anus and the histology as well. So let's get started. Three simple questions to test what do you already know about the GI system. As always, I'd recommend pausing these videos at this point to kind of give yourself time to think um, because I want to keep these videos short in bite-sized chunks. So question one. Which GI layer is characterized by having a tough, fibrous connective tissue? Is it the serosa, the submucosa, the muscle, or the mucosa? So for this, try to think about the generalized layers of the GI tract, and which layer you think needs to be tough and fibrous. So here, if you try to work out what's on the outside of the GI layers, you'd know that it's the serosa. And the serosa needs to be tough and fibrous and made up of connective tissue because it is the outer layer, and it's protective. Question two, the what nervous system division normally stimulates and promotes digestion? Is it a central, sympathetic, parasympathetic, or somatic? So here, think about your different types of nervous system and think about what the general role of each one is. So the answer here is the parasympathetic nervous system because it's all about resting and digesting, whereas your sympathetic nervous system is all about fight or flight response. And one more question, what type of cell in the stomach secretes hydrochloric acid? Is it the delta cell, the goblet cell, chief cell, or parietal cell? So here, the question's given you a clue. It's told you that it's a cell that's in the stomach. And you've got to think, well, which one of those secretes hydrochloric acid? And remember that that acid's there to keep the pH of the stomach low at around pH 2. The answer here is parietal cell. And the parietal cell also secretes intrinsic factor. The other answers are part of the GI system, but don't secrete hydrochloric acid. So the chief cell secretes pepsinogen, the goblet cell secretes mucus, and the delta cell secretes somatostatin. So let's move on to have a look at some of the basic principles of the GI system. So remember, the GI system's all about digestion, and it's about converting the food that we eat into energy and basic nutrients. It's made up from the all cavity at the top, through the pharynx, the esophagus, the stomach, the small and large intestines. There are several accessory organs as well to be aware of, so liver, pancreas, gallbladder, and so on. But remember that digestion is a multifaceted process, which means it's achieved by a combination of nerves, hormones, enzymes, and bacteria. And it's vital for breaking down the food that we eat, as we've said, into energy that we can use, also for growth and cell repair. And remember that digestion starts right at the top in the oral cavity. The peritoneum is a structure to be familiar with, and it's a thin, serous membrane that lines the abdomen and pelvic cavities. So it can be compared to the pericardium of a pleura, so the pericardium surrounding the heart, or the pleura surrounding the lungs, because it's made up of two layers with a potential space in between. The parietal peritoneum lines the walls of the abdomen, where the visceral peritoneum lines the organs or the viscera themselves. So if a structure is said to be intraperitoneal, it's when an organ is completely covered with that visceral peritoneum. So examples of these include the stomach, the jejunum, and the ileum. On the other hand, you've got the retroperitoneal structures. So this is when an organ lies behind the peritoneum, or it's only partly covered by it. And examples of these include the pancreas and the ascending and descending colon. So here, this is a nice diagrammatic representation of the peritoneum, which for those of you who like diagrams, it might be a little bit easier to understand. So digestion can be split into three phases. So you can have the cephalic phase, first of all, which is when you smell, see, or think about food. And it's that initial thought that activates the neural centers in the brain and prepares the food and prepares the mouth and stomach for food to be eaten. Then you've got the gastric phase. So this is when the neural and hormonal mechanisms promote gastric secretions and motility. And then you've got the intestinal phase, when the food enters the small intestine and slows the exit of chyme from the stomach, and it stimulates flow of those of the bile and the pancreatic juices that aid the digestion post being in the stomach. So now let's focus in on the anatomy of the GI system. And something that a lot of people forget to do is take a look at the anatomy from a surface point of view. So understanding that this, for example, is the oral cavity, going down into the esophagus, and then you've got the liver here, then the stomach, the spleen just tucked away behind, 
and you've got your large intestine or your ascending colon if you want to be more precise you've got your appendix down here uh, this is your gallbladder then you can go into your rectum and your anal canal so understanding the basic anatomy of the GI system is really important because we can come up in exams just to label the anatomy so then go into the mouth so this for example is the hard palate and then this is the uvula you've also got your soft palate and this of course is your tongue then here this is your palatoglossus and linked to the palatoglossus you've also got your palatoglossal arch which demarcates the back of the oral cavity going into the oropharynx at the back and then here you've got your palatine tonsil so note how these three structures on this side uh, well going across but all in the same area all have this same prefix of palato then you can zoom in on the tongue and take a look at the papillae that line the tongue so up on the um, outer side here you've got these fungiform papillae and these are round and large and they're along the margin of the tongue then in the center you've got these filiform papillae and what's really important about these is that they don't have taste buds but they do massively increase the surface area of the tongue then at the back you've got the valet papillae and there are 8 to 12 of these normally and they form this v-shape in front of the terminal sulcus which lies just behind and these are blunt-ended and cylindrical the only other thing to be aware of in terms of the tongue is that you have got foliate papillae, which are linear folds of mucosa which line the sides of the tongue. Then let's go down to the stomach. So going into the stomach, of course, you've got the esophagus. As you enter the stomach, it goes into the cardia. And at the top, you've got that gas-filled area, which you can see on a CT, the fundus. Be aware of the muscular layers of the stomach as well. So these are slightly different to the GI system in normal. So you've got your longitudinal muscle as normal and your um, circular muscle as normal but then you've also got an additional muscular layer of the oblique layer going down this is the body the largest part of the stomach and going into the duodenum before it goes into the duodenum it must go through the pyloric orifice or the pyloric sphincter which are in the pylorus of the stomach lastly be aware that you've got rugae so these are circular folds um, of the stomach which allow the stomach to expand on ingestion of a large meal so then we move on to the liver. So the liver can be anatomically divided into a right and left lobe, but also into quadrate and chordate lobes. So you've got the gallbladder, of course, which is tucked behind on the anterior view and bright and open in the posterior view. You've also got this round ligament of tears here, uh, which extends below the liver. So as we've said, the right lobe, this bare area on top is in communication with the diaphragm, and it's the only retroperitoneal part of the liver. So as we've said, you've got your chordate lobe, your left lobe there, and this is your falciform ligament which divides the left and right lobes. Then we've got this hepatic portal vein, the proper hepatic artery and the common hepatic duct. So remember the hepatic portal vein is really important in the venous drainage of the GI system and it goes all through the liver to the sinusoids before it returns to the inferior vena cava. But we'll cover this a little bit later on. So then you've got your quadrate lobe as we said, the right lobe and the gallbladder. Moving down from the liver, you can look at the pancreas and the biliary tree. So know here, for example, that you've got your gallbladder, and then you've got these two ducts which leave the liver, so the right and left hepatic ducts, and these fuse to form the common hepatic duct. This then binds with the cystic duct from the gallbladder to go down here into the common bile duct. Then you've got your pancreas here, and your main pancreatic duct here. So all of this joins together here at the ampulla of Varta, where it enters the duodenum. Moving on, you've got your large intestine. It's a fairly simple structure, but actually you need to understand that this is your appendix up to your ascending colon. Transverse colon, colon is demarcated between the right hepatic flexor, which goes up towards the liver, and your left hepatic flexor, which goes up towards the spleen and the stomach. And then you've got your descending colon here, and this goes down into your rectum. Like we've said before, so this was covered in one of the questions at the start of the um, session, be aware of the normal generalised layers of GI tract. They can vary from place to place, so for example, remember your stomach has that extra oblique muscular layer, but as a general rule of thumb, you can count on the mucosa being on the inside with the epithelial lining, then the submucosa, then your muscle layers and your serosa on the outside. So moving on to embryology, can be quite a tricky subject. However, if we break it down bit by bit, we're going to look at it organ by organ. So the primitive gut forms around the fourth week of development. And the flat embryonic discs fold to form a, muscular, form a tubular structure. So your gut starts off as a tube, hence the gut tube. And it's derived, in, 
divided into three distinct regions. So you've got your foregut, your midgut, and your hindgut. So the foregut gives rise to the esophagus, the stomach, the liver, the gallbladder, the bile ducts, the pancreas, and the proximal duodenum. Then you've got your midgut, which gives rise to the second half of the duodenum, the jejunum and the ileum, the cecum, the appendix, the ascending colon, and the proximal two-thirds of the transverse colon. And then lastly, you've got the hindgut, which gives rise to the last third of the transverse colon, the descending colon and sigmoid colon, and the upper anal canal. So the GI embryology, remember, it all comes from the ectoderm. And you can split it into an anterior, a middle, and a posterior part, which are your foregut, your midgut, and your hindgut. The anterior part can be further subdivided into a cranial and caudal aspect, and the cranial aspect gives rise to the pharynx and the um, pharyngeal arches. And then the middle part, the midgut, is a continuation of the yolk sac. So let's have a look at those in a little bit more detail. So with embryology, just one thing to remember is that the connective tissue, the smooth muscle, and the serosa all arise from a splanchnopleuric mesoderm, not the ectoderm like the rest of the GI tract. So remember the three aortic branches, so you can see these here. These are continuous over the celiac artery, the superior mesenteric, and the inferior mesenteric artery, each supplying the relevant foregut, midgut, and hindgut structures. So first of all, let's have a look at the foregut, which is probably the most in-depth embryology explanation. So the foregut, first of all, let's have a look at the stomach. So the primitive stomach rotates 90 degrees, and it causes uneven growth. So essentially, the posterior side of the stomach grows more than the anterior side, which causes this J-shape, and therefore the formation of the lesser and greater curvatures of the stomach. So when it rotates, it pulls the dorsal mesogastrium over the top of itself, and this forms the lesser sac. Now within the dorsal mesogastrium, you've normally got the spleen growing, and therefore the spleen is pulled over into the left hypochondrial region. So remember those nine divisions of the abdomen, um, which you can do on surface anatomy. So therefore, the gastrosplenic ligament forms between the stomach and the spleen, and then between the stomach and the liver, you get the lesser omentum. And within the free border of the lesser omentum, you've got the hepatic artery, the bile duct, and the hepatic portal vein. So remember that the stomach is entirely intraperitoneal. Then you've got the duodenum. So the duodenum is derived from partly the foregut and partly the midgut, half and half, and you can separate it by the entry of the bile duct. It's a solid structure at first, and therefore it must undergo recanalization, which is a process to restore the hollow lumen of the duodenum. Failure to do this causes a duodenal stenosis, so this is relevant for second year, and a duodenum rotates to the right, whereas your stomach rotates to the left. And remember that the duodenum is going to have a dual blood supply because it's partly derived from the foregut and partly from the midgut. So the duodenum is a retroperitoneal structure because it's only covered in peritoneum on the anterior surface. Then you've got your pancreas. So the pancreas develops from a dorsal and ventral bud. And the dorsal bud is in the dorsal mesentery and the ventral bud is in the ventral mesentery. These then come close together, twist and fuse. And the duct of the larger dorsal bud forms the main pancreatic duct. The pancreas is retroperitoneal, all except the tail, which remember the tail's the part that tickles the spleen. Next, you've got the liver and the biliary tree in the foregut, and the liver forms from the hepatic diverticulum, which expands to fill the septum transversium. The liver is large in size, as you can see in this diagram, and by 10 weeks it's forming the blood cells for the baby, for the fetus. Um, so the gallbladder duct is solid at first, and again must undergo recanalization, so a common theme. And if it doesn't, it'll cause extra hepatic biliary atresia. So remember, the liver is completely intraperitoneal, except that bare area on the top. Midgut structures. So at first, the midgut has a wide communication with the yolk sac. This narrows to form a vitello intestinal duct. The midgut rapidly elongates, and it can no longer fit in the abdomen, and therefore it has to herniate out of the abdomen into the umbilical cord. It undergoes it undergoes some rotation and then returns to the abdomen. So the midgut, as we've already said, is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery and is made up of these structures. Lastly, you've got the hindgut. So the endodermal lining also forms the epithelial lining of the bladder and the urethra, and the primitive cloaca structure opens. The mesenchymal tissue then comes in and divides the cloaca into an anterior part, which will be your urogenital sinus, to do with the UG system, and posteriorly into the rectum. So the mucosa of the upper half of the anal canal is from the hindgut endoderm, and the mucosa of the lower half of the anal canal is from the ectoderm, so the proto proctoderm. And the pectinate line demarcates the upper from the lower halves. So it fills completely and then recanalizes around week 9. So that's everything for this video. Join us in part 2 and 3 to continue looking at the innovation vasculature and the pathway from mouth to anus. Thank you very much for listening.